A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, we brought you 107 facts about Star Wars Rebels. Okay, so it was a year ago and it was on Cartoon Hangover, but still, in the age of the internet, that's a lot of time, and a lot has changed in Rebels. We've seen the return of old faces, older faces, old faces who were expelled from canon, and familiar faces with new hairstyles. So there's a lot of ground to cover, like this fact submitted by user Team Rocket. In Star Wars Rebels, occasionally the producer slash former supervising director Dave Filoni will voice some of the stormtroopers. I did not know that. Thanks, Team Rocket. Although I feel I think we should point out that somebody who goes by Team Rocket probably denounces the evils of truth and love. Should maybe investigate that fact. Hi, I'm Tim with Channel Frederator, and we've got the scoop on all big Rebels moments. From Ahsoka and Darth Vader's duel, to the long-awaited return of Grand Admiral Thrawn, to the future of the series itself. So let's bust open those holocrons and have some of our questions answered as we cover 107 more facts about Star Wars Rebels. Let's get started, and may the Force be with us always. Number 1. Star Wars Rebels premiered on October 3rd, 2014, exactly six years after the premiere of Star Wars' previous CG animated series, Star Wars The Clone Wars, though it takes place 22 years after. Number 2. The creative team behind Star Wars Rebels treat the show's development as if it were a live-action production, mapping out backdrops as if they were real, physical sets. This is due to the fact that George Lucas came from a live-action filmmaking background while commanding the Clone Wars production team, so the Rebels team upholds that tradition. Number 3. Executive producer Simon Kinberg doesn't view the characters as animated when reading over their scripts. Despite the fact that animation is virtually limitless in nature, Kinberg still views these characters and scenarios as if they were to be performed in real life. This helps keep the show's characters and action grounded. Number 4. According to Kinberg, one of the most challenging aspects of creating a Star Wars story is making it feel like Star Wars. He explained that it takes more than filling up a world with stormtroopers, X-Wings, and Death Stars. It comes through developed characters, faithful dialogue, and most importantly, passion. It's not just something a screenwriter can translate. You have to live, breathe, eat, and sleep Star Wars. Number 5. Before co-creating Star Wars Rebels, Simon Kinberg played a huge part in producing 20th Century Fox's X-Men franchise. Number 6. His work on the Star Wars franchise is expanding beyond Rebels, though, as he's been tapped to write a still-unknown Star Wars anthology film. Number 7. How could a ragtag group of fighters take down the galaxy's biggest empire? Kinberg likens the show's concept to the American Revolution. Imagine five farmers living in colonial America during the 1700s that start speaking out against the British Empire. Then they take up arms and fight alongside their patriot brothers and sisters. The message is that revolutions are fought and won by ordinary people. Number 8. The creative team behind Rebels wanted to capture something that hadn't ever been explored in Star Wars films before. Civilian life under the rule of the Empire. They really went above and beyond, ironing out every single detail of a civilization shaped and policed by the Empire. Like how many stormtroopers there are to a single citizen, the currency of the Galactic Empire, what is allowed to be sold at marketplaces, and what's considered illegal. Number 9. The writers have Star Wars Rebels thoroughly planned out, so much so that they have known the fates of all the characters from the beginning of development on Season 1. Interestingly, the writers trusted the actors enough to tell them the fates of their characters from the get-go. For example, Freddie Prinze Jr. knew from the very beginning that Caden would be blinded at some point. What the actors don't know is when or how these occurrences will go down. Number 10. Kanan's sidearm of choice is the DL-18 Blaster Pistol, a weapon favored by Jabba the Hutt's goons in Episode 6, Return of the Jedi. Number 11. After Season 1, one, Dave Filoni took aside Sabine's voice actress, Tia Sarkar, and told her that they were looking to make modifications to Sabine's design, specifically her hairstyle. While her suggestion didn't make its way into Season 2, it did make it into Season 3. Sabine's Season 3 hairstyle was the design that Sarkar had envisioned for the character. Number 12. After two seasons of Star Wars Rebels, Sabine finally earned her Mandalorian Rite of Passage by obtaining her very own jetpack. One of the first questions Sarkar had for Dave Filoni when her work on the series began was whether or not Sabine would get one. Wish granted. Number 13. Hera's new militarized look in Season 3 is made to mirror her allegiance to the growing Rebel Alliance. She even wears a Rebel rank badge showcasing her status within the faction. Number 14. Have you ever stared up into space and asked yourself, how in the world did Hera ever meet Kanan? Wonder no more, for Disney Publishing released a prequel novel answering that very question. It's called Star Wars A New Dawn, written by author John Jackson Miller. Miller is known for writing other classics from the Star Wars expanded universe like Knights of the Old Republic, and yes, it is canon. Number 15. Greg Weissman has expressed interest in writing a spin-off comic for Hera, in the same vein as the spin-off comic Marvel published for Kanan. He's even pitched the idea to Marvel and Lucasfilm, but sadly to no avail. Number 16. For Season 3, the team lightened up Zeb's wardrobe, stripping him of his heavy armor and leaving him with a uniform more akin to what an alien species would wear in Star Wars Episode 4. This will be the case with other characters in the show as the timeline nears the events of the original trilogy. Number 17. Zeb's design was based on a piece of concept art by Ralph McQuarrie depicting an early design 
sign for everybody's favorite Wookiee, Chewbacca. Number 18. Despite his hulking size and tough demeanor, Zeb was depicted as being a scaredy cat in one point in his development, before becoming the sadistic stormtrooper slayer we know and love today. Number 19. In addition to playing Zeb, Steve Bloom plays the show's stormtroopers as well, making Zeb's love of beating them up a little bit odd. You have probably heard Steve Bloom from a lot of other places, like Cowboy Bebop. Number 20. The helmets that Ez Morrigan's henchmen wear are based on an unused design for the galaxy's greatest bounty hunter, Boba Fett. <laughs> Number 21, writer Azadi went by a different name during the earliest stages of his development, Vol Freeless. Both are pretty Star Wars-y, all things considered. Number 22, Azadi's trusty rifle is actually a modification of Stila Guerrera's rifle from the Clone Wars, because recycling is always a good thing. Number 23, Azadi isn't the first Star Wars character that Clancy Brown has portrayed. He previously portrayed Savage Opress in the Clone Wars. If Clancy Brown's name still isn't ringing a bell, he's also the voice of Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob SquarePants. I don't care about the children! I just care about their parents' money! Number 24. In our last video, we likened Chopper's behavior to that of a grumpy family cat, but he wasn't always this way. His sour attitude is the result of many years of repairs and patch jobs, leaving him beat up and worn out with no personal tune-ups in between. Number 25. Chopper's name is a reference to his model number, C110P. If you merge the dashes with the ones, you get an H, and if you replace the zero with an O, you get the word chop. Number 26. The owl-like creatures that inhabit the show are called Converies, named after Dave Filoni's wife and Convery Filoni. They actually debuted in Star Wars The Clone Wars during the Waska arc, when Ahsoka is kidnapped by the Trandoshans. They appear on many different planets throughout the galaxy. Number 27. One of the most significant writing challenges of Spark of the Rebellion was finding a balance in making characters like Ezra and Sabine mature, yet youthful, and sophisticated, yet inexperienced. Kinberg strove to make their banter appear playful as opposed to whiny bickering. Number 28. Simon Kinberg had always wanted to do a zero-g chase sequence, admiring a zero-g sequence in Apollo 13, but they're incredibly difficult to pull off in live action. Doing one in an animated Star Wars show is a match made in heaven, and his dream was finally achieved in Spark of the Rebellion. Number 29. The shot of Bail Organa placing the chip into R2-D2 in Droids in Distress is framed exactly like the shot in A New Hope, where Princess Leia is doing the same thing. Number 30. Vision of Hope originally went by a more spoilery title, Lure. Number 31. In the episode Rebel Resolve, we gain access to a holographic file containing statistics statistics on Kanan, including a list of crimes he committed against the Empire. These include theft of Imperial supplies, resisting arrest, assaulting officers, and piloting without a license. Number 32. So we've seen our B-wings and our Y-wings, but when exactly are we going to get X-wings on the show? Dave Filoni says not to hold your breath, at least not for the time being. He claims that X-wings are a part of a different story at a different time than the one currently being told on Rebels. They're from a time in which the Rebels are a much more unified and bigger faction, capable of doing real damage to the Empire. Number 33 the writers have a plan for how they would introduce X-Wings if and when they ever appear on the show. As a major influence, they cited a scene from Steven Spielberg's Empire of the Sun, when the P-51s arrive at the camp. Filoni really wants the moment to be a special oh my god, this is what I have been waiting for moment, as opposed to oh hey look, it's an X-Wing, that's cool. Number 34. Speaking of which, the introduction of fan-favorite X-Wing pilot Wedge Antilles came from the writer's desire to incorporate more connective tissue from the original trilogy without relying too heavily on the big stars. They look towards the Star Wars gallery of unsung heroes, often asking themselves, where were the X-Wing pilots at this point in time? What did Biggs, Porkin, and Antilles do before the events of the original trilogy? The inclusion of a familiar face like Wedge also serves as a good before and after for how the Rebels functioned when they first began, in comparison to the more organized Rebel Alliance that successfully steals the Death Star plans. Number 35. Before defecting to the Rebel Alliance and aiding Luke Skywalker in destroying the Death Star, Wedge Antilles actually served the Empire, honing his piloting skills through his training at the Sky Strike Academy. He affected after the Empire hurt his family, friends, and a girl he once loved. Number 36. The Antilles extraction was originally meant to introduce Biggs Darklighter, and would have revealed that the pattern on his helmet was designed by the Ghost's resident artist, Sabine. This idea was dropped when the writers realized that A New Hope contained implications that Biggs joined the Rebellion not too long before Luke did, so they scrapped his appearance to avoid inconsistencies. Number 37. The stolen TIE fighter seen in the episode Fighter Flight was originally set to appear much earlier in the series. Over the course of a few episodes as a project 
project Ezra and Sabine were working on in the background. All references to this secret project were moved, both to save time and to make its reveal more impactful and surprising. Number 38. The stolen TIE fighter's paint job contains some familiar iconography, including symbols from Sabine's helmet, Kanan's arm guard, Hera's Leku, Zeb's armor, and even Chopper's face. This was done to symbolize the team coming together. Number 39. The look of Malachor was based around the concept of a graveyard planet. This led to the idea of placing the Sith temple in a dark underground cavern, something akin to a tomb. Number 40. The theme of day and night is also played into the design of Malachor. When the characters are on the planet's surface, they're standing in broad daylight atop a black surface with holes poked through it. Beneath the ground in the temple, however, the ceiling resembles a starry night sky. Number 41. Do you recognize the Malachor temple but can't put your finger on why? Well, that's because the geometry of the temple is identical to that of Moraband from Star Wars The Clone Wars. Number 42. The design of the temple also plays into the themes and flows of the character's choices. It's designed as a series of escalating plateaus. For each plateau, the writers staged critical scenes that allowed the characters to make important decisions, which would ultimately affect their destinies. They discuss their fates on the way up and make a decision upon reaching a plateau. Number 43. The petrified people found below Malachor's surface were added by the artist to give the area a sense of history and to show the viewers, as well as the characters, that other lost souls once wandered the caverns. Number 44. These people are also a reference to the ancient Roman city of Pompeii. Pompeii, as you probably recall from high school history, fell victim to the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. The eruption caused the citizens of the city to be entombed in layers of volcanic ash. Number 45. Ahsoka carries lightsabers with curved handles, which gives off just the slightest hint of a samurai katana. Number 46. Sam Whitner and Ashley Eckstein were given a detailed rundown of what happened to Maul and Ahsoka between the end of the Clone Wars and the beginning of Rebels, in order to inform them of the history their characters had with each other. Number 47. The story of how Maul and Ahsoka had previously met wasn't just made up by Filoni on the fly. It was written a long time ago, back when the Clone Wars was in production, and was meant to be told as the last story arc of that particular series, before its run was prematurely ended. However, Filoni still wrote their interaction as if they had met, knowing their first encounter would one day be told. Number 48. And it was told. The novel Ahsoka by E.K. Johnston reveals a lot about Ahsoka's post-Clone Wars days, including her showdown with Darth Maul at Mandalore, and her final encounter with Anakin and Obi-Wan. Number 49. The season 2 finale originally culminated in a lightsaber duel between Darth Vader and Maul. Who would have won this fateful encounter, you asked? George Lucas gave his writers a rule when writing for Darth Vader. Never diminish him. So, translation, Maul was going to lose. Number 50. The writers ultimately decided against having Maul fight Vader because, while it would have been cool, there's not much more to it than a nerdy power fantasy. Ahsoka, on the other hand, has a deep personal history with Vader, making for a much more compelling and emotional encounter. Number 51. Filoni consulted George Lucas about what would happen if Ahsoka met Vader, and both agreed that Ahsoka couldn't serve as a vehicle for Anakin's redemption, since that would negate Luke's role in the original trilogy. Instead, Vader views Ahsoka as the embodiment of his past, a grim reminder of what he once was. He wants to destroy anything that even reminds him of Anakin Skywalker, including his old Padawan. Number 52. One of the biggest challenges the writers faced while working on the show was devising the much-anticipated reunion between Ahsoka and Darth Vader. The team had pondered every little detail, like if Ahsoka would playfully refer to him as Skydai, like in the old days. In the end, they found a middle ground between personal and distant, giving Ahsoka a playful undertone while making Vader more cold, slowly revealing to Ahsoka what exactly Anakin has become. And yeah, it would have been weird if he referred to her as Snips at any point. You're getting ahead of yourself, aren't you, Snips? Don't call me that! I hate it when you call me that! Number 53. Filoni initially regretted Vader's line, our long-awaited meeting has come at last, believing it was way too on the nose. He was shocked that this cheesy line even made it into the final draft, and even more shocked that when James Earl Jones read the line aloud, it was so convincing and effective. He now believes that it connects perfectly with Vader's line from A New Hope. I've been waiting for you, Obi-Wan. Number 54. According to Filoni, the recipe for a great lightsaber duel is not just the choreography or how many lightsabers one can wield at the same time, but the events that proceed and follow. This is especially evident in the duel between Ahsoka and Darth Vader. It makes moments like the ones which Vader's mask breaks more effective. That moment originally didn't include dialogue, but it was decided that Ahsoka should attempt to reach out to Anakin one more time, just to tug at our heartstrings a little. Number 55. Matt Lanter momentarily replaced his Clone Wars character, Anakin Skywalker, during Vader's 
battle against Ahsoka. After his helmet is slashed open, the choice to have Matt Lanter's voice overlap with James Earl Jones' voice was made to confirm Ahsoka's fear that Vader and Anakin are one and the same. Number 56. According to Freddie Prinze Jr., the voice actors did not know the ending of Twilight of the Apprentice due to the fact that there's no dialogue in the scene, meaning they had to wait until the episode premiered to find out how it ended. Number 57. Ahsoka and Vader's encounter was supposed to play out very differently than what we saw in the final product, and it was probably changed for the better. Originally, it was Darth Vader that got the jump on Ahsoka, not the other way around. Additionally, after Ahsoka slashed off part of his mask, Vader would have dealt a fatal blow to her body, implying that he did in fact succeed in killing his former apprentice. Number 58. One of the reasons the writers decided not to explicitly show the outcome of Vader and Ahsoka's duel is because the Star Wars Rebels story is not their story. That's why their fight was seen from the perspective of the characters that the show does revolve around. Wrapping up Ahsoka's arc in a story that's not her own disrespects her and deviates from the story that we're here for. The writers believe the ending to the Anakin and Ahsoka story is too interesting to be shoehorned into somebody else's tale. Number 59. When asked about Ahsoka's painfully vague fate, Filoni simply said he doesn't think we've seen the last of Ahsoka. Whether that means she got away or became a force ghost remains to be seen. Number 60. The Inquisitors are another group of characters that will be phased out over time. The reason being canonical consistency. Number 61. During A New Hope, when an Imperial talks to Vader and calls the Force sorcerer's ways, the usage of the Force seems as if it's a mythical art that has not been seen in a very long time. You can't exactly claim that if there are Inquisitors roaming around doing their inquisiting thing. Number 62. Season 3 takes place about a year after the conclusion of Season 2, with the characters still coping with the events of Season 2's finale. Number 63. Simon Kittenberg and Dave Filoni refer to Season 1 as the A New Hope era of the show, due to its lighter playful tone and its means of introducing characters to the challenges they're going to face for the rest of the show. Number 64. Season 2 is referred to as the Empire Strikes Back era for its darker tone, higher stakes, and further exploration of the character's backstory. Number 65. The name of the Force-sensitive Bendu comes from the original name given to the Jedi by George Lucas. During the early treatments of the first Star Wars script, they were the Jedi Bendu. Number 66. Filoni originally envisioned Bendu as a massive creature on which the Rebels would accidentally construct an entire base. After returning from a mission, the base would have just vanished because Bendu moved. He was going for a twist on Yoda's size doesn't matter message from The Empire Strikes Back, instead depicting an immense creature that doesn't use his power at all. Number 67. Bendu is based off Tom Bombadil, a character from Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Much like Bombadil, Bendu is on the older end of the age spectrum with a strong sense of neutrality, but he still leans towards the good guys. Number 68. The voice on the Sith holocron is that of the ancient architect of the Malachor Temple. While her name and history are currently unknown to the viewers, Dave Filoni knows the truth and has gone as far as writing a backstory for the character. Number 69. The Sith holocron allows Ezra to progress in his training much more quickly than he would if he were being taught by Kanan. This is, of course, how temptation to the dark side works. It's been referred to as the quick and easy way, but with a heavy price to pay. Number 70. Maul's Lair was originally intended to be used in an unfinished episode of The Clone Wars that would have continued Darth Maul's backstory. Because of the untold story that Maul has with this particular location, the writers thought it would make sense that the former Sith would return there and set up shop. Number 71. Dave Filoni wrote Darth Maul's encounter with Ezra to be reminiscent of Luke's meeting with Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back. Ezra's mentality during the scene mirrors Luke's initial belief that power will solve all of his problems. Number 72. The idea of Maul wanting to possess Ezra for his power came from the fear Dave Filoni felt watching Emperor Palpatine attempt to control both Luke and Darth Vader in Return of the Jedi. He decided to up the ante by having a kid be tempted by a man with a red face and scary horns. Number 73. Maul was not exactly exaggerating about how long he's been on Malachor. He was stranded there for quite a few years before meeting Ezra. Maul had arrived on his own ship, which had broken down when he landed on the surface. He came with the intention of accessing the temple, but Maul has some terrible luck and couldn't even accomplish his initial goal. Number 74. Maul finally understands how expendable and unimportant he was to Emperor Palpatine. This left him very, very, very bitter. Filoni stated that even if Palpatine were to shove Vader aside and welcome Maul back as his apprentice with open arms, Maul would rather kill him. I mean, the dark side is kind of about holding grudges and being angry, so. Number 75. While Maul has a burning hatred for Palpatine, that doesn't make him a force for good. For the time being, Maul's willingness to stop the bad guys that wronged him outweighs his urge to return to Jedi murdering. Number 76. Kanan feels jealous of Maul to an extent, seeing how the former Sith wishes to become Ezra's new mentor. Filoni has likened the scenario to a father teaching his son how to play catch, until the son is old enough to join a baseball team. By which point, the son forms a bond with the coach instead. Number 77. The decision
decision to blind Kanan was inspired by the Star Wars tradition of characters losing limbs, like Luke's hand, Anakin's hand plus. The writers had an interest in seeing how characters react to loss, how they overcome it, and how it changes them as a person. Number 78. Kanan's blindness serves as a metaphor for him as an incomplete Jedi taking on an apprentice. Because Kanan never completed his own training, he doesn't really trust himself to do Ezra justice. Number 79. You may be thinking, so what if Kanan is blind? He can use the Force to compensate, right? According to Filoni, no and yes. He claims that the Force doesn't function like a superpower. He says that the Force is powered by belief. You are as limited as you allow yourself to believe. If you believe enough, you could even see new things you couldn't before. Number 80, the markings on Kanan's new mask are meant to resemble the eyes of Captain Rex. It shows that Kanan has learned to see the world through Rex's eyes. Number 81, the white armored Mandalorians that chase Ezra and Sabine are based on the mock-up costume developed for Boba Fett back in the late 1970s. Number 82, while Disney's expulsion of the former expanded universe did away with many beloved characters, Rebels has taken the liberty of resurrecting fan favorite Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn appeared as the primary antagonist of a trilogy of Star Wars books that took place after the events of Return of the Jedi. His role and character have been altered to better fit the current Star Wars timeline. Number 83, Thrawn is played by Lars Mikkelsen, known for his role as the Russian president in the Netflix series House of Cards. Number 84, Lars Mikkelsen is the older brother of actor Mads Mikkelsen, who is playing Galen Erso in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Number 85, Thrawn is one of the few non-human Imperial officers. He belongs to the blue-skinned, red-eyed race known as the Chiss. Number 86, at one point during his development, Agent Kallus was also envisioned as a member of the Chiss species. Number 87, of all the characters they could have resurrected from the expanded universe, Thrawn was chosen because the writers liked the idea of a Star Wars villain that wasn't a force user, but was so brilliant and influential that he could pose a huge threat to even the likes of Luke Skywalker. Number 88, Thrawn has a deep appreciation of art and foreign cultures, even if they belong to the enemy. In fact, Thrawn is known to learn a lot about his enemies by studying their art and culture, which makes great and Admiral Thrawn, the Star Wars villain that would track down and look up Star Wars fan fiction. Number 89, Thrawn is actually short for, and brace yourselves on this one, Mithran Rodo, his full birth name. Number 90, if you've never read the old expanded universe novels about Thrawn, but you want to know more about him, Disney Publishing's got a new novel for you, cleverly titled Thrawn. Number 91, when asked if Star Wars Rebels would serve as a venue to revive expanded universe characters wiped from existence, like Luke Skywalker's wife, Mara Jade, Filoni stated the odds were unlikely. Number 92. A fan once asked Dave Filoni if the new but beloved Star Wars character, Maz Kanata, could possibly appear in Star Wars Rebels due to the fact that she's over 1,000 years old. Filoni stated that while it was a great idea, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do it. Number 93. While we shouldn't hold our breath for a live-action adaptation of Star Wars Rebels, Simon Kinberg says that we could very well see characters from the series make appearances in future Star Wars films. It did happen to Saw Gerrera, a character from the Clone Wars who's now prominently featured in Rogue One. Number 94, Dave Filoni is very supportive of fan theories and will often intentionally place hints and clues throughout the episodes that he knows diehard fans will decipher. So, for instance, if you see a symbol on an owl that resembles a marking found on Ahsoka, you're not crazy, there's a connection between the two. Number 95, Hasbro held an election in 2015 over which new character would make it into their long line of Star Wars action figures. The two finalists were Sabine and Revan, who were so close in votes that Hasbro decided to make figures for both of them. Number 96, according According to Freddie Prince Jr., you never have to ask if Rebels will be renewed for another season. Disney spent $4 billion to obtain Star Wars and intends on making as much of that money back as possible. Number 97, unlike Clone Wars, which came to an abrupt end without a proper conclusions, Rebels will be telling a complete story with a beginning, middle, and end. At least, that's what Filoni intends. The story will also end before the events of A New Hope, so it can feel like its own chapter in the greater Star Wars mythos. Number 98, while the popular action figure video game hybrid Disney Infinity featured all of the Ghost's crew, except for Hera and Chopper, Hera had a figure in development, until Disney Infinity was cancelled. Her figure's design was shown to the public, depicting her in her Season 3 outfit. Number 99. The award for Best Parents in the Galaxy goes to Sandy and Ariane Camps, two toy store owners that built a life-size replica of Chopper for their three-year-old daughter. Though the droid looks perfectly authentic, it's made from a mishmash of old junk. Number 100. Simon Kinberg has said that if there's a lesson to be learned from the show, it's that if you try your best, believe in yourself, surround yourself with 
trustworthy people and question authority, then you have the power to make a positive difference in the world. Number 101. So you may or may not be happy that Darth Maul is in Star Wars Rebels, and that's fair. What you may not know though is Sam Whitner, who voices him, has previously played Maul in Star Wars The Clone Wars, Lego Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Out, and Disney Affinity. Number 102. While Carrie Fisher wasn't available to reprise her role as Princess Leia in Star Wars Rebels, actress Julie Dolan was. If Dolan sounded accustomed to the role, it's because it wasn't the first time she's played the princess. She portrayed her in Disney Infinity, Star Wars Uprising, Lego Star Wars The Freemaker Adventures, and Star Tours. The adventures continue. Number 103. Actor Steven Stanton replies to his role as Tarkin, which he had previously played in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Number 104. If the voice of the presence of the Sith Temple sounds familiar to you, there's a reason. The voice was provided by Nika Futterman, who previously played the villainous Asajj Ventress in The Clone Wars. Number 105. Dave Filoni loves to cast the actors he worked with on The Clone Wars so much that he's constantly trying to get everybody to return. While he often tries to get them to reprise their roles, he can't always find a legitimate way to get characters into the show. So he just creates new ones, like the presence at the Sith Temple. Number 106. Tom Baker isn't the first Doctor to be featured on Star Wars. Actor David Tennant previously played the droid Hu Yang on Star Wars The Clone Wars, a performance that nabbed him an Emmy. Number 107. The voice of the RX-24 pilot droid found in the first episode was provided by actor Paul Rubens, perhaps better known to the general public as Pee Wee Herman. There you have it. Once again, I'm Tim, and thanks for watching 107 more facts about Star Wars Rebels. You now have 250 total Star Wars Rebels facts, so you're practically a Jedi Master. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know which animated film or TV show you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your cartoons, subscribe to Channel Frederator. And remember, Frederator loves you.